Hey, good evening. I think all of you are tired. Some energy, please. Good evening. You. So I uh, take care of Startup Grind in New Delhi. Uh, I'm the director there. Uh, I'm here to introduce somebody uh, who needs, uh, I don't think, any introduction. He's every tech guy's idol, probably. Uh, a middle class boy from India who came to America way back in the 80s, found, co founded a company, uh, and you know, turned it around and made it into, uh, you know, became the, one of the biggest venture capitalist firms. He's been termed as the astute venture capitalist in the, in the world, and he loves to ski. Please put your hands together for Mr. Vinod Khosla. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. So our, your third time at Startup Grind, you're kind of becoming a, a staple here. So thank you. Yeah, I love coming to talk to entrepreneurs. How many of you were here last year? Anybody? A few. Great. Every time I've interviewed, I've started with a question, but then you always had a different question that you want to start with. So I'm going to just let you start. Tell us. <laughs> I have a habit of not, uh, like, like all entrepreneurs, have a habit of not confirming, but I'll let you ask a question. <laughs> Surprise you. <laughs> so, let's talk about the relationship between entrepreneurs and investors. What, what should be the expectation of the people that I'm taking money from and I'm letting come in to mm -hmm. be part of my company? Uh, I find this question entrepreneurs give less thought to and maybe one of the most important early decisions they make. Um, an investor is going to interact with you once a week or once a month or once in a board meeting every six or eight weeks. Uh, and they're going to exercise what they think is a lot of influence. It's the most important decision you make in who you want to partner with. And, and people pay a lot of attention to who their co-founder is, but not who their investor is. Money is the least important thing, especially in early stage, that you get from an investor. Advice, networks, all that, but frankly, I think the most important part in invest, uh, that uh, role that an investor plays for an entrepreneur is first having them think hard. So my job with any entrepreneur is to have them think about the things they haven't thought about. Um, push them to think about things I may not believe in, but I think they should at least think about. So I often take points of view that I actually don't believe in, because I really believe a business plan gets better, an entrepreneur gets better if they're sensitized to other issues that aren't their natural inclination. Um, All your entrepreneurs know this too, though. Isn't this confusing? It's like, is Finod, is he, is he saying this, or is he, I mean, I don't care whether they believe I do or don't believe it, and sometimes I'll tell them I don't believe it, but here's why you should think about it. Um, you want somebody who pushes you hard, makes you think hard, pushes you to your limits, and tries to expose every possible risk in your business plan. Now, some of those risks are real, some of them are perceived, but if you've thought about them, you can handle them. Sometimes I, I say to entrepreneurs, 
And occasionally, an entrepreneur will come to me and say, I'm not really looking for money, uh, so I don't want to talk to a lot of VCs. And I say, it's OK to still talk to VCs, because every time they surface a reason they don't like about your business plan, they are identifying a risk or a potential risk. And if it's just a potential risk and not a real risk, you can dismiss it, but only after you think about it. So somebody who pushes you to think about things even makes you a little uncomfortable. I think there's real value in that to an entrepreneur. The flip side of this, uh, and this is one of the reasons I don't go on boards anymore. I seldom go on boards uh, because all the VCs want to vote on this or that. And I don't believe a board in a small startup company should ever vote on anything. It should always be the founder's decision. Right? So the job should be to push them hard, make them think, and then let them decide, not the board decide what to do. It's a really important distinction. Most VCs do exactly the opposite. Yeah. They want to be nice. They want to be polite. They don't add any value because of that. Uh, if they have concerns, they don't surface them. Uh, but then they want to vote on this or that. So are, are you saying, I mean, part of being so on the board? So I'll tell you this. In 30-some years of being on boards, there's never once that I have voted against what a management team wants. Even if I disagree with them, there's one exception I'll come to. Even if I strongly disagree, I'll argue with them, I'll debate with them, I'll push them. But I will not vote against them. And the only exception is hiring and firing of a CEO. Uh, and sometimes, and, and people who say they never do that are lying to you. Sometimes it's necessary. Um, I was working with somebody today, and their board wanted to fire them. And I talked a lot about all the things he could do the next nine months to avoid getting fired. Right? And so my job, and I wrote a blog on this in TechCrunch probably three years ago that I think all founders should read. It's a two-part blog. The first part is called how not to need a new CEO, because this comes up a lot. And a startup is almost always better off with the founder and the founder instinct driving the company. Isn't, isn't, that, a, isn't that a, to be fair? Just finishing the thought, the second blog I wrote <laughs> is what to do if you do need a CEO. Right? Those, those are important reading for early stage founders. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, it's OK. Um. But back to this question of what you should expect from a board member. <laughs> Look, all of you are going to deal with this. Get people around you. <laughs> Both board members, investors, even co-founders, who are going to push you hard, disagree with you, but in a constructive way. And not people who rubber stamp and agree with you. And, and then get people who let you make the decision, not think that somehow the board knows more. No board member who comes in once every six weeks for a board meeting while you're working 80, 90 hours a week is qualified to make a decision, any decision. <laughs> Look, there are so many nuances to developing a startup that somebody who isn't in the trenches dealing with every small issue is never going to be able to aggregate it into this is what we should do. Only thing you can mouth if you are off on if you show up every six weeks is platitudes that every VC talks to every, everybody else about while playing golf. I don't play golf, but. You ski. I, I ski. I can't talk to VCs while skiing. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, it's fine. Uh, I have a lot of opinions on startups. Sure. <laughs> Next year, maybe we'll just uh, 
We'll get it to move the chair just right here, and I, we'll see. Um, I'll talk to the entrepreneurs yeah, directly. I know. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it, so I've heard you say this before that you always agree with the management team, but as an entrepreneur, the ability to to fire me is sort of a huge exception to yeah. like always agreeing with me, right? Yeah. So, I mean. I mean, that's the biggest thing, right? D boards can disagree, boards can have disagreements, but are you, are you ultimately, when, you, when I'm taking your money, do I think with a high degree of confidence that you're not gonna throw me out and kick me out of my own company? So the best way to do answer that question, there's no one answer to that question. We try really, really hard to have the founder as CEO. I spend a lot of time trying to coach them to be successful and build the teams around them that will make them more successful. Fundamentally, if the founder is not CEO, you've lost probably the most key element of a startup, instinct and insight and a particular philosophical approach to doing things. Look, good managers don't have belief systems. They know how to manage people absolutely critical in a startup, but not in the CEO role. So what makes for a good manager makes for a really bad charter new territory, be disruptive in a big area, approach it orthogonally. Those two personalities are not similar. The management function is number two down. The leadership function of here's our belief system, here's what we want to do, here's what we want to try, um, here's the disruption we want to cause. Only founders have that. That's why very few great managers can charter new territory. And that's what you want a startup to do. And so we try really hard to make a founder successful. Um, um, I'll, I'll give you an example, this public example. John Herring was CEO of Lookout. Till the last weekend, I tried really hard. Now, he said he can lead that company without being CEO. And I kept saying to him, John, don't give up the CEO title. You could ask it. I fought really hard with him. And he said, I don't want to do any of the management. And I finally got it. I said, OK. And it's worked out very well at Lookout. It's a big company now. But keeping that founder instinct is so important that to us, the investment's worth a lot less with a manager as CEO over a founder as CEO. So it is necessary sometimes. So you'd be, I'd be lying if I said it's never necessary. But you try really hard to avoid it. And you want VCs who want to encourage that. What metrics do you measure yourself by on a weekly, monthly, yearly basis? <clears throat> so, like I said, I don't go to board meetings, but I meet with founders and sometimes their teams regularly. And I try and measure each meeting. If I'm going to take up two or three hours of founder's time and his team's time, I always say, did I walk out of the meeting with questions that are really important to their business? Right? If I haven't made them think, I've wasted their time. If it's just an update to me, if it's just a financial review, if it's just sales reporting, I've wasted their time. If they walk out of a meeting saying, here's two or three things I need to think about hard, or two or three people I need to chase, uh, that's, to me, a metric. Overall, I sort of say, if I haven't doubled the potential of a company, the markets they're going after, the way they're approaching it, the revenue they're getting, the business model innovation that value, doubles the value of the company, then I, as an investor, haven't added enough value. That's every, how I... Every year or every what? Over the course of an investment. Okay. Right? Uh, to me, very few people look at it that way. 
Very few people even believe you can do that with founders or with companies. I completely believe it. And I can give you 10 names of people to talk to, say, yeah, we thought about our company differently, or we wouldn't have done this or that. The other thing is, um, and we were talking about this outside, I have this view that what a company plans is largely irrelevant. I've talked about plans not being that valuable, business plans. A company, in my view, becomes the people it hires because they're the people in the trenches with you for 80 hours a week influencing your decision. So I spend an incredible amount of my time recruiting at every level in a company. Whether it's a key technologist, whether it's a product manager. Down to what level? Down to the product manager level? I've done individual engineers. So I've talked to some VCs about this, about you specifically, because you're the only person that I know that does this. And, um, and some very smart people have said, Vinod, Vinod is way too smart to spend his time doing this. And they, and they do completely different things. So what, what is your response to that? Why do you, keep, why do you, why do you, why do you interview engineers? So if I can avoid a hiring mistake or get a great resource on board, now, we were recently competing for an engineer in one of our startups against Google. We lost that particular battle, but Google was offering them millions of dollars in RSCs. But it was such a key person that they could change this company. Mm. It's well worth my time. So I can tell an entrepreneur what to do. That's not going to be effective. Uh, I can raise questions, but unless their team is complete and, and, and disparate enough to have multiple points of view, diversity in the team, they're not going to be able to take a question and handle it well, because it's not just a dialogue with me. It's all the conversation that goes off on after they go home. Yeah. Uh, Getting the right team is the best way to help a company to think broader, think better, think higher. So I spend an incredible amount of time doing that because the best way to help, yeah, you can be on a board and say, no, you're going to pursue this business plan. That's silly for a board to vote on because if the founders don't believe it, they're not going to do it or do it well. What's, uh, you know, the, the values of a company become this, like, magnet of people, right? And, and they, they become who the company is and who it attracts, almost in this unnatural way, right? Yeah. And so how do I, as an early stage um, uh, entrepreneur, how do I determine what the values of my company are, what those core tenets are when I'm just, I'm so early, I don't even really know what I'm, re I'm, I'm actually building? So... Look, it's an evolutionary process. Sometimes founders know exactly what they want to do, but when they do, they often start changing it as they right. engage. Mike Tyson, I think, said everybody has a pre-fight plan, but when the first plunge lands, that plan goes out of the window. Great uh, quote. Great founders know this, right? And you can pretend to your investors and your board members and others that you have this business plan, it's largely relevant. We can come back to the value of a business plan because there is some value to doing one, but not much value to following one. Uh, uh, Do you, you, don't mean a, you don't mean a tangible business plan. You're just saying the, the plan that you put together. You're, you're, yeah. not, you, you don't have, you're not still seeing business plans at this stage, are you? Uh, not business plans, a deck. Yeah. Same yeah, thing. Yeah. To me, it's the same thing. But what a founder, to go back to your original question, we can come back to the business plan question, uh, has to do is evolve a belief system. And when people talk about MVP and fail quick, what they're really saying is run lots of small, non-lethal experiments and iterate your plan. Because if you're trying to do something new, 
applying conventional wisdom. If you're trying to do something healthcare, you hire a big healthcare name, what you're going to get is healthcare traditional beliefs, and you're not going to be able to make any changes. So in our healthcare companies, I prefer not to hire anybody out of healthcare in the lead roles. It just they do the traditional thing as opposed to new things. So a founder then, it's not like that learning isn't important, and they can get one of those guys out of five in their senior team, just to say somebody, oh, it doesn't this work this way, and you as a founder go figure out why it doesn't work that way as opposed to accepting it. But iterating and running lots of small experiments and failing in small ways is exactly how you evolve a plan. I call it a plan to plan or a flexi plan. You're not doing a plan and executing on it. And that I can help a lot. Very often I argue with people, founders, pretty hard about why they shouldn't follow advice they're getting. I'm not telling them what to do. I'm mostly telling them what not to do so they can figure out what to do. Because I can't tell them, figure what, figure, tell them what to do because I, I'm not in that 80 hours a week working on one thing. Those nuances that become part of figuring it out. This is a fairly nuanced argument. And so it's, it's a hard one to understand. But you almost always evolve good plans. You never make them. That raises two other related questions. One, why is a plan important? A plan's only important because when you start out or adapt, you want to think hard about all your risks. And in doing that, and talk to as many people on how you might fail. Once you know that, those are things as you learn, you can build plans against or firewalls against or mix, maximize the probability of success, but also minimize the probability of failure. So that's why planning or thinking about your DAC or business plan is important. But you also have to realize as soon as you get in the fight, you want to start changing it and changing it. And I hate board members who say, what did you say a year ago? Well, that's largely irrelevant. And CEOs who are founders who start sticking to trying to deliver what they promise generally end up in the wrong place because that's based on the assumption you knew a year ago, everything you know now, that's wrong. It raises another really important question all of you will face, how much money to raise? Uh, not a question you ask, but it's a really critical question. <laughs> the more money you raise, the more people you hire, and the more you start executing on your initial plan, as opposed to saying, I actually, this is my first guess, and every two or three months, I'm going to change my plan, and I'm not going to start executing. I'm going to start discovering my plans. Much easier to do when you have small amounts of money, not a high burn rate, not a lot of risk. And so I generally say people who raise more money reduce their probability of success because of this factor. They hire teams, they hire experienced people, and they start executing on the wrong plan or on a rigid plan. It's a common danger I see. This is exactly what's been happening in the last few years, though, and this has been driven by venture capital. This has been driven by this kind of madness that we've been around. And I now get so upset with VCs who want to do large fundings for companies that aren't ready, who their plan isn't baked enough. You all don't do that? You've never done that? We try and not do that, OK? <laughs> I'd say we seldom do that. Once in a while, we've done it for some particular reason. But then I spend all my time uh, pushing founders to think much harder about what they're trying to do. Look, this is very hard. And since I'm talking about this issue, one way to reduce the risk is to engineer diversity into your uh, gene pool in the company, in the founder set, in the kitchen cabinet, or the senior team, whatever you want to call it. 
So a couple of years ago, I wrote another long blog about engineering the gene pool of a company. Many of you will be looking for co-founders or partners. Please read this blog. It'll help you think about who you want as a co-founder, how you build that team. The number of times I get initial teams coming to me early, and they've hired a VP of marketing or a VP of sales, and they're exactly the wrong people. Very often, I prefer an incomplete team to a wrong, complete team. And most often, look, if you're a technical founder and you're a wizard in physics, you've made some big discovery or done something in fintech through machine learning, you won't know what a good marketing person is. And anybody you hire is probably good on the resume and credentials, but not able to think critically about your problem. So get help in doing that. If you hire, ask a VP of marketing in a big company, they won't know what a VP of marketing in a five-person company needs to do and how much is uncertain. They know maintenance marketing, not disruptive marketing. So those kinds of things become really important, and that's what I push founders to do. Sometimes it makes them uncomfortable because I'm questioning a lot of things. But if they feel comfortable, I'm never going to vote one way or another. I'm going to let them make the decision. Most of them get pretty comfortable after a while. Uh, most, most people that I have met uh, that are, let's, let's call them uh, peers of you, uh, and have had the success that you have had, most of them are just kind of taking it easy. And one thing that I, I find very interesting and unique about you is you seem like you still have this real chip on your shoulder about making things happen and fighting and, and kind of like just, you know, making the change that you want, you want to make, whatever it is. But I wonder, like, first of all, why, why do you still have that? You've proved so much. You have nothing to prove at this point. Uh, uh, you've been so successful. Why do you still have that, and how do you still have that? Because, like, how do you still have the energy to, okay. have been through so many so wars? Let me answer that question, but I'm going to start with a question that's directly relevant to founders. If you've had success before, I love talking to founders, you know, and uh, try and make everything I say relevant to founders. Sure. Um, uh, that's why I had a big fight with TechCrunch the last time I spoke there. It's a fun interview because the press hated it because they kept trying to ask me questions about valuations being high or low. And I said, that's not relevant to founders. It's relevant to the press to write articles. I'm not here to... Well, I, I look at you as an entrepreneur. I don't look... I don't... I, I mean... Thank you. Yeah. I, there, there, there are a few people, you know, somebody like a Trip Hawkins who, who started EA in the early 80s, has started two or three companies since with varying levels of, of success, he's still fighting, right? And there are very few people that hit these levels of success along the way you founded, co-founded Sun Microsystems. You know, you could have done anything you wanted, and yet here you are still fighting so, as, as a So as let me explain that. But first, let me say, the more success you've had in the past, the less critically you examine your own assumptions as a founder. So if you've had a great success, your probability of success in your new startup actually goes down unless you're really critical of yourself, right? So just a word of caution, the more credentials somebody has, the more assumptions they make, the less they test them, the less they do the MVP thing, and the more likely they are to fail. That's why YC founders who generally first-time founders do so well, and, and I love that model. I have a history of not looking at history. So I was telling Derek, <laughs> I've never kept an award I got. I don't take honors. I turn them all down or throw them all out. I don't do IPO tombstones. I throw them away. I never look back. To me, this is not about a chip on my shoulder. I'm very happy. I'm very satisfied. I'm internally driven. 
Uh, I'm very internally driven, and I gave a talk, and there's a YouTube video I did at one of the IIT conferences where I talk for an hour about this issue. Most people get externally driven. What's expected of you? I'm internally driven, and frankly, I'm sort of selfish. Like, what's fun for me? Creating a disruptive new startup is a lot of fun. Mentoring a founder is a lot of fun. Helping them expand the scope of their startup or help them build a team, that's a lot of fun. Looking at spreadsheets is no fun for me. <laughs> uh, I got off the board of Square just before the IPO because IPOs are no fun for me, you know? Uh, being on a board and status is a waste of time to me. Working with entrepreneurs is a lot of fun. That's why I do it. And I do it because I'm motivated to do it. I'm also very motivated for the most impactful startups that can actually have an impactful future that can make a difference in society. That's way more important a role I can play, helping them succeed than, say, spending my time like a lot of retired people on, on, a, on philanthropy or a foundation or something. Now, Bill Gates is doing an amazing job at that. He's a, he's a rare exception. Yeah. Okay? But most people sort of go into this retirement mode where they want to play golf. Right. I find working with a startup way more interesting than playing golf. It's much harder, too. Right? I, I prefer brainstorming a new idea way more interesting than watching a movie. It's just more fun, especially if it can be socially impactful. I don't spend a lot of time on things that I actually don't think are socially impactful. Uh, there are other partners in our firms that do that, and that's great. I just like making a difference, too. But sometimes I do it just because something's a really cool technology and it's just worth doing. Vinod Kosla, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.